Uh, I've got one lengthy quote, so that'll be my John Morrison tribute uh, this morning. <laughs> All right. We probably need to pray. Uh, it, it, will, it doesn't probably involve forgiveness. Let's, uh, let's pray and then we'll get into uh, Galatians 3, which I think is pretty cool. Father, thank you so much for uh, what you're doing here in our midst. Thank you what you're doing in our uh, community. Thank you for your word, uh, your truth. Thank you that it's all wrapped and infused in love. Fathers, we look at Galatians 3. and pray that you'll open our minds to, to your scriptures. Um, help us to take these things to heart. And most of all, Father, thank you that you've uh, sent us your spirit to indwell us, to lead us into all things. Thankful for your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, you may turn in your Bibles to Galatians 3, but I'm going to give us a recap of where we've come from uh, before we get into the content there. And it's interesting, um, in the context of what John was sharing um, with the Martin Luther quote, Galatians is Paul taking the gospel and addressing a very specific point of argument uh, that's, that's come about as a result of this situation uh, in Galatia. So there's, there's these false teachers, rival teachers, um, trying to compel Jews to be Gentiles. Paul takes the gospel and addresses that exact point. And I also thought the uh, Al Mohler quote was interesting about about revolutions. There's a slow buildup and then it happens very quickly. Um, greatest revolution the world's ever seen is the resurrection of Jesus and the aftermath of that. There's a long buildup to that, but man, when he comes, it happens and it happens fast. Um, so I thought that was just interesting tying in with what John had shared. But the resurrected Jesus encounters Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. He reveals himself to be Israel's long-awaited Messiah. Like all the Jews, Saul of Tarsus had awaited certain promises promises, um, certain expectations, finds out that actually they had all happened. They just didn't happen in the way that they had expected them to happen. Um, Paul goes off to uh, Arabia for about three years. You can imagine him pouring over the scriptures again. And for somebody who knew these things backwards and forwards, I bet it was like just reading them completely fresh and new in light of Jesus and seeing um, things that were always there that he just hadn't seen in the same way. He goes to Jerusalem where he gets acquainted with Peter and James for about two weeks. And again, I'm sure Peter's able to fill in some gaps, uh, accounts some stories, personal stories with Jesus. I'm sure that enhanced both Paul and Peter with their time together. However, while they were there, I'm oh, sorry, yeah, while in Jerusalem, he confirms to, uh, let's see, nope, there's two Jerusalem trips. That was Jerusalem number one. Jerusalem uh, number two, Paul is sent from Antioch. Remember, Agabus gives this prophecy about a coming famine. The church in Antioch sends relief money to Jerusalem. So Paul and the buddies come around, they get to Jerusalem. He confirms that the gospel that he's been preaching is consistent with theirs. However, while there, there are some false brethren that stir up trouble by trying to compel Titus, who is a Greek, to get circumcised. Gentile Jesus believers, as we've looked at, do pose a threat to the community by refusing to participate in the mandatory Roman worship sacrifices and festivals. The Jewish, the Rome had given the Jews a special uh, exemption to the mandatory worship. Um, they realized these guys aren't going to worship Caesar. They're not going to pray to Caesar. So if you pray for Caesar, um, we'll let you be exempt from these mandatory things. When Gentile Jesus believers come along, they're not also, they're not worshiping the Roman uh, forms of worship. They're not sacrificing to them either. Um, you can claim a Jewish exemption, but what's the problem? How are they supposed to, the, the Jewish neighbors and the Roman neighbors, nobody's going to look at them and say, well, what's Jewish about you? Why would you give you, why would we give you this exemption? It's very problematic. And uh, to the point, John, that you were making about tearing down arguments, it's, it sounds like a good argument to say, well, isn't the loving thing to do for your neighbor to get circumcised, keep us safe? You, you guys can survive. We're in good shape. Everything stays kind of settled. And Paul says, no, the gospel actually says no to compelling that kind of compulsion. 
So compelling Gentiles to take on the typical Jewish markers, things like circumcision, kosher diet, Sabbath keeping, all of that, in theory puts everyone at ease. Um, of course, Paul's not at ease at all. He, he'll have none of that because he sees such compulsion as a denial of the gospel itself. Through Jesus, through his death, Jesus had conquered the power of the idols. All right, we sang about that this morning. He conquers the power of sin and death. So sin and death, those are the chains that enslave us to idols. We're set free. Gentile Jesus, or the Gentile Jesus believers are no longer considered idolaters and therefore unclean. Their status is righteous. Through his resurrection, Jesus inaugurated God's new age. So in his resurrection, God's new age now overlaps with what the Bible would call the present evil age. And living in that new age means coming out of the old. To compel Jesus believing Gentiles to take on Torah prescribed markers is to take them back to that present evil age. It's the equivalent uh, in Paul's mind of Israel being free from Egypt and then going back. Paul defends Titus. The Jerusalem leaders concur. They add nothing to Paul and his message um, except to say, uh, continue to you know, think about the poor, and Paul was already on top of that. From there, Paul goes to Galatia, establishes churches throughout the region, returns to Antioch. When he arrives in Antioch, he finds that people from Jerusalem are there. These seem to be the ones to whom Peter reacts by withdrawing from table fellowship with the Gentiles, which we saw in Galatians 2. He was enjoying their company before the coming of these people. Meanwhile, back in Galatia, rival teachers have come behind Paul and brought him and his message into question, accusing him of being a people pleaser and teaching a false gospel. Paul responds forcefully to both situations. He confronts Peter to his face in front of everyone, and then he writes what I would call a fiery letter to the Galatians. In both cases, Paul argues that Jesus believers, Jews and Gentiles, are part of the same single family of Abraham. Prior to Jesus, his family would have been identified by works of Torah, but Paul argues that this is not indeed the marker of the family. In Galatians 2, Paul argues for the fact that Jews, not just Gentiles, have changed their status as a result of Jesus. They've been declared righteous on the basis of faith, not works of the Torah. One of the things that Paul said there was, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. I had to come out from under Torah in order to do this. For Jewish Jesus believers, their identity is now Jesus and his faithfulness, not the Torah and its prescribed markers. For the Gentile Jesus believers, their identity is now Jesus and his faithfulness, not their now defeated idols. So the question that Galatians wrestles with is, who are Abraham's true children? And the answer is not those who are circumcised, but those who share faith, in the sense that we saw last week. And I love that definition that we saw from Teresa Morgan. Faith is a relationship which creates community, sustains communities as an embedded in social practices and institutions. All right, so that's kind of the whirlwind that gets us up to Galatians 3. Um, Paul launches into an, the next stage of his argument that the Jesus um, believing Gentiles are already full recognized members of Abraham's family so they don't have to add anything else and in addition to that he has to argue this in such a way that these believers can claim the Jewish exemption Paul's got a tall order to do here this is a this is an inch it's like how are you going to pull this one off and I like here's my tribute to John Wright says, uh, this is just kind of a summary of what we're dealing with with chapters 3 and 4. Wright says, God always envisioned an ultimate worldwide Abraham family marked out by faith. And this family has now come into being through the Messiah's death and resurrection and the gift of the Spirit. The Jesus family, the ex-pagan Gentiles have joined, is therefore the true Abraham family. Paul is well aware that he is treading a fine line. For his argument to meet the point at issue, this new Messiah family must be clearly Jewish enough to claim the Roman permission. But its Jewishness 
is a transformed Jewishness. Not surprisingly, this is difficult to argue clearly, but this is what chapters 3 and 4 are all about. The Galatians already have the status and identity they require to make the case, whether or not anyone will pay attention, that they are officially exempt from pagan worship and constitute a new community with its own legitimacy and its long history. Paul, how are you going to pull this off? Let's go to Galatians 3. Can I? We good? Thank you. We'll start in verses 1 through 5. Paul comes out, Brian, without the velvet. <laughs> you witless Galatians. <laughs> Who has bewitched you? Messiah, Jesus, was portrayed on the cross before your very eyes. There's just one thing I want to know from you. Paul's going to now ask four rhetorical questions. <laughs> one thing he wants to know. Did you receive the Spirit by doing the works of Torah or by hearing and believing? Are you so witless you began with the Spirit and now you're ending with the flesh? Did you really suffer so much for nothing if indeed it is going to be for nothing? The one who gives you the Spirit and performs powerful deeds among you, does he do this through your performance of Torah or through hearing and believing? I just want to know one thing from you. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. All right, his rhetorical questions are actually making a point. <coughs> Here's the point. You, the Galatian Gentile Jesus believers, received the Spirit by hearing and believing. You didn't receive the Spirit because you nailed 613 laws. And even if you did, that's not what brought the Spirit about. You received the Spirit through hearing and through believing. If you start there, why would you go back to this? And if you can do this, how are you doing on 613 laws? Because it says that if you break one, you've broken them all, and now you're back into bondage. You don't go back to that. So you receive the Spirit by hearing and believing. So that's key to Paul's argument about Gentile believers being identified as full members of Abraham's family. All right, I'm going to send you on a Bible drill situation. Uh, Romans 8.23. Let's go there. Actually, I'm on this too because I don't have this one written down. Romans 8.23. We're going to look at a couple things that uh, Paul says about the Spirit. Some of the terms that he uses when he refers to God's Spirit being with believers. Romans 8.23. Paul says, And not only this, but, we, uh, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Um, a lot there, but the point being, he's referring to the Spirit as first fruits, and first fruits are the first things that come, but they're a guarantee of something bigger to come. So you have this foretaste, this first fruits, this promise that there's more to come. Second Corinthians one twenty two. We're just going to keep going to the right. First, Second Corinthians one, verse twenty two. I guess I'll read the whole sentence, even though I am cherry-picking here. Uh, 21. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. All right. And if your Bible's like mine, you'll note that that word pledge uh, literally means a down payment. You've been given a down payment of something. That's that first fruits thing. It's a down payment of this promise. Ephesians 1.14, similar situation. It's hard to find Paul starting a sentence and not reading a whole chapter. I'm just going to read verse 14 in its in its isolation there. Um, it says that the Holy Spirit of promise and it describes the Holy Spirit as the one who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. That word inheritance is important. Quiz question. Who gets an inheritance? An heir. An heir. Okay. 
keep that in mind as we as we go through this. This Holy Spirit is a pledge, he's a down payment. What's the inheritance? When you go to let me not jump ahead of myself. Let me jump ahead of myself. When God, when God talks to Abraham, what does he promise Abraham? He promises him that through him all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. And he says, I'm going to give you this land. But like as the Bible goes on, you get to things like if you did your homework, Psalm 2. Psalm 2 verse 8, there's this inheritance. And it's not just this little piece of land. It's the entire earth which is really cool. This thing spread out. Um, Psalm 2, Psalm 110, there's a king, and that king is king over all things. The inheritance is the whole earth. It's, it's spread out. Daniel 7, uh, 13 and 14, there's this son of man figure. This guy comes before the, before the ancient of days, and he gives him an everlasting kingdom. What's the expectation of this Messiah, this person that's going to uh, come to Israel? He's, the inheritance is the whole world by the time you're looking for Israel's Messiah. So the inheritance, you could say, is the new creation itself. Back to the, the Spirit as a pledge. The family of Abraham are identified as those with the Spirit, whom Paul describes elsewhere as a down payment, first fruits of the new creation. And again, that's one of the cool things about resurrection. It's like, what do I have to look forward to? Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits of what I have to look forward to. All right, the renewal, the resurrection of our bodies. So he's the down payment, first fruits. It's not Torah and it's markers, it's sharing faithfulness and it's the gift of the Spirit. And when you talk about the gift of this indwelling Holy Spirit, this is a little bit of an aside, but I just thought it was too interesting to not say. One of the things that N.T. Wright noted was that this, the living God dwelling within us, think about that. That always blows me away and I always feel like that's true. I know it's true, but it's like, I've got to be more put together if this is true. <laughs> The living God dwells within them, he says. And he says, this is actually the beginning of what becomes the tradition of theosis, which, John, you've talked about in the past. But here's how he describes it. It's the organic remaking of human beings by the indwelling of God himself through his spirit. Does that renewal happen because we kept Torah? Again, that's 613. If you did 612, guess what? Sorry. No, it wasn't that. It was hearing, it was believing. It's, you have this gift of the Spirit. He's the down payment. If you've got the down payment, guess what? You're an heir. What are you an heir for? The inheritance, the new creation. So keep that inheritance in mind as we continue uh, into Galatians. All right. Ken, I'm sorry. I'm failing to have another slide. Thanks. Uh, verses uh, 6 through 9. Paul continues, It's like Abraham. He believed God and it was counted or reckoned to him for righteousness. All right, and I've put the uh, verses that he's quoting in the Old Testament in brackets there. He believed God and it was counted or reckoned to him for righteousness. So you know it's people of faith who are children of Abraham. The Bible foresaw that God would justify the nations by faith, so it announced the gospel to Abraham in advance when it declared that the nations will be blessed by you. That is really good news, by the way. That is gospel good news. Through your family, families of the earth are going to be blessed. So you see, the people of faith are blessed along with faithful Abraham. All right, do you see what Paul's doing here? This is that, how do you define this new thing in the context of its uh, redefined Jewishness? And I think the key is this phrase, reckoned to him for righteousness. That's an important phrase. And the way Paul understands it is important too. The way we typically hear about this is that it's kind of like a moral bank account. Uh, I'm, I'm immorally depleted. Jesus is morally perfect. He transfers, it's like a wire transfer over to us and we, we have his stuff. Um, there might be something to that, but that's not really what Paul uh, and some of these first century guys are thinking. Reckoned to him as righteousness is referred to uh, refers to two people in the Old Testament. One is Abraham. And who did we say the second one was? Do you remember? It's Phineas. 
Phineas, the guy that stabs the um, the guy and the lady who are um, idolatrating, is that a word? Um, the Moabite. All right. It's a weird situation. He's sort of a minor uh, character, but uh, I'll read this in a second. Numbers 25 is where we've read this account before, but after the incident, so Phineas is on zeal for the Lord. Uh, by doing what he did, he stops a plague. And here's what God says about Phineas in Numbers 25, verses 12 through 13. Behold, I give Phineas my covenant of peace, and it shall be for him and his descendants after him a covenant of a perpetual priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made atonement for the sons of Israel. As a result of Phineas's zeal, the Lord makes a covenant with him, and that covenant is for him and for his descendants forever. It's a covenant of a perpetual priesthood. If you want to go to Psalm 106, this is where uh, the phrase reckoned to him as righteousness refers to him. The psalmist says in Psalm 106, verses 30 and 31, it's recounting some of Israel's history. And at this point it says, Then Phineas stood up and interposed, and so the plague was stayed, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness to all generations forever. All right, what does reckon to him as righteousness mean? It doesn't mean that he was morally depleted and got a transfer of morality. It's about covenant making. Reckon to him for righteousness is covenant language. And in the case of Phineas, it's an everlasting covenant of a perpetual priesthood for his family. All right, I'm going to do something dangerous. I'm going to quote two Apocrypha writings. Now, Apocrypha, if you call it deuterocanical, it's just writings that happened between Malachi and Matthew. They're not the Word of God, but they're prominent writings, and it, and it helps you understand how the people of the first century were thinking, what their expectations were. Now, again, what was the expectation about a Messiah? He was going to do all these things. Well, Jesus did it, but he didn't do it in the way that they expected. Some of those writings, especially in the Maccabees, show you what happens when you try to do things of yourself and you're not waiting on the Lord's deliverance. I'm going to force this thing to happen. It doesn't happen. However, some of these writers, here's what they say about Phineas. This one comes from Maccabees. It says, Phineas, our ancestor, because he was deeply jealous, received the covenant of everlasting priesthood. They understood that when God reckoned to this, reckoned to him as righteousness, he was making a covenant with Phineas. Um, Sirach 45 is called a hymn in honor of our ancestors. So there's this hymn in the book of Sirach. It goes goes through a bunch of different, um, what I just call Old Testament figures, and it comes to Phineas. And there's a whole section in this hymn about him. Here's part of that hymn. It says, Therefore, a covenant of friendship was established with Phineas, that he should be leader of the sanctuary and of his people, that he and his descendants should have the dignity of the priesthood forever. So it's understood that God made a covenant of perpetual priesthood with Phineas and his descendants. Psalm 106 describes that covenant in terms of reckoned as righteousness. All right, if we take that context in mind and we shift our attention back to Abraham uh, in Galatians 3, we'll see what's happening with Paul. Paul quotes two verses from Genesis. The first is Genesis 15, 6. Then Abraham believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. A couple verses later, God makes a covenant with Abraham to guarantee that Abraham's descendants would indeed inherit the land that God promised. Abraham's descendants, or their, his heirs, receive the inheritance. And again, it's the land. Just as Phineas was the head of a covenanted family of priests, so Abraham is the head of a covenanted family of the faithful. At least that seems to be Paul's argument. If that's the case, the Gentile Jesus believers already bear the mark of being part of that single family of Abraham, which means, number one, that they qualify for the Jewish exemption because they're recognized as part of that family, and two, all believers enjoy the same table fellowship together. There's none of this, you're unclean until you do X, Y, and Z, and then you add that to this, and then we're, then we're good to go. If I lost anybody, are we good? Okay. 
think that's fascinating. Because I think you think about Abraham, it's like, who are his descendants? Well, his descendants are his descendants. Phineas's descendants are his descendants. They're the priests. You know they're his because they're the priests. But look at what verse 9 says. You see, the people of faith are blessed along with faithful Abraham. He, his faith was in God. God reckons that to him as righteousness. So the covenant is about this faithful thing. His descendants aren't necessarily, at least Paul's saying, aren't necessarily just his physical descendants. It's the faithful because that's what the covenant's about. It was with faithful Abraham. Therefore, the people of faith are part of that family. And if you're part of Abraham's family, Rome's given you an exemption to not do the mandatory worship. And the gospel demands that you're one family. You better act like it. You can't have this split. Over time, the promise to Abraham does come to be understood in a broader, much broader than just a piece of land. Psalm 2, as we talked about just a minute ago, the reign of the Lord's anointed um, is what that's about. Verse 8 says, Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and to the very ends of the earth as your possession. So in Psalm 2, God's king is not only given the land promised to Abraham, but that king is promised the whole earth. It's consistent with that son of man figure that we talked about in Daniel. It says he was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. This dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. That's good news. If we read Genesis 15, 6, all right, he believed God and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. In light of things like Psalm 2 and Daniel 7, then we see that the inheritance extends far beyond a narrow piece of land in the Middle East. In this sense, Abraham's descendants inherit the whole earth, which again is consistent with that second verse that Paul quotes from Genesis. Nations of the earth will be blessed in you. I think the first half of um, Galatians 3, 8, I guess I should go back. The Bible foresaw that God would justify the nations by faith, so it announced the gospel to Abraham in advance. Um, God is going to declare the Gentiles righteous by faith. And again, that's the good news announced to Abraham. And so Paul quotes Genesis 12, 3. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And if you want a formula, I think here's the formula. The, the solution to Adam's sin is Abraham's family. The solution to Adam's sin, what happens when Adam sins? Um, this whole bring the earth under the dominion of the Lord project goes off the rails. Right, that's what Adam's, that's what we're created to do. We're created to have dominion over the earth, to bring about its flourishing. Right, Adam's sin prevents that from taking place. What's the solution to Adam's sin? It's Abraham's family inherits the earth. And that family was always promised to be multi-ethnic. And Paul argues that they're identified by that, um, that Greek word pistis, faith or faithfulness. And they are blessed along with faithful Abraham, the head of that covenant family of the faithful. I cannot move forward on this thing. All right, verse 10. We'll look at... Uh, We'll look at 10 through 14. So Paul continues, Because, you see, those who belong to the works of the law camp are under a curse. I don't know what your version says. I've got the New American Standard, and it was the worst sentence I've ever, <laughs> grammatical sentence I've ever seen. It made, it, it, you can kind of get there, but it's a, hard, it's a hard thing to get your mind around. All right, because, you see, those who belong to the works of the law camp are under a curse. Yes, that's what the Bible says. Cursed is everyone who doesn't stick fast by everything written in the book of the law to perform it. It's from Deuteronomy. But because nobody is justified before God in the law, it's clear that, and he quotes from Habakkuk, the righteous shall live by faith. The law, however, is not by faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live in them. It comes from Leviticus 18. 
The Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse on our behalf. And again, as the Bible says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. This was so that the blessing of Abraham could flow through the nations in King Jesus and so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Those are really cool bookends, by the way. And this isn't a bookend because his argument is going to continue on, and that's for another message for us. But did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? That's how he starts chapter 3 out. Where do, we, where do we bookend here with 14? What's the end goal? So that we might receive the promise, the guarantee, the down payment of the Holy Spirit again through faith. If you go to Deuteronomy 27, we'll look at verse 26 there. So Paul, again, I, you can imagine, again, after that encounter with Jesus, Paul went back to all this stuff, and I think these things meant something to him that they didn't mean before Jesus encountered him. Here's what, here's what Deuteronomy 27 says, and by the way, 27, 28, 29, you're looking at a lot of cursing, not swear words, just like bad things that are going to happen as a result of faithfulness. And, and Moses lays it all out. Here's, here's where this goes. Here's how this ends. Verse 26 in, in chapter 27, cursed is he who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And what did everybody say? Amen. 613. You committed to it. There's this cool thing, though, about the bad news is never the end of the story. Right? What does Clay always say? The best is yet to come. Deuteronomy 30. I don't know if you have a title in yours, but mine's titled Restoration Promised. Deuteronomy 27, 28, 29. If you're, faith, if you're faithless, here's, here, here's what happens when you're faithless. But chapter 30 is always around the corner. If you're living in a time where you're living in Deuteronomy 27 through 29, which they're doing right before Jesus, what's the hope? What's the promise? Deuteronomy 30 has got to be right ahead. You always have this thing to look forward to. And Paul's saying, this thing happened. How did that thing happen? It says, Cursed is everyone who doesn't stick fast by everything written in it. Verse 11, But because nobody is justified before God in the law, it's clear that the righteous live by faith. The law, however, is not by faith. The one who does them shall live in them. No one's declared righteous by keeping Torah because you can't keep Torah. So Torah binds you up. In some ways, it becomes a log jam to this promise that was given to Abraham because now you're bound to this thing. And in, in, in seeking to fulfill the law, the law tells you you're a transgressor. And now if the family that's supposed to rescue is in need of rescue itself, what do we need? Well, we need a Messiah. Verse 13. The Messiah redeemed us. Redeems us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. He quotes Deuteronomy, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. I wanted, if Paul was one of my students, Pete, and he was writing an analysis paper, I would say, that's great. Why and how does him hanging on a tree deliver us? You can take some comfort in that Paul doesn't say, <laughs> at least not right here. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Why is it that Jesus' cursed death frees us up? There were a lot of would-be messiahs in Israel. And again, if you want to read a little bit about that, the Maccabees tried really hard, um, failed. But you have a lot of failed messiahs. What happens to failed messiahs in Rome? You crucify them. That guy isn't who he said he was. And we see this now because he was put to death and he died. Jesus is claiming to be a Messiah. He ends up on a cross. Was he a failed Messiah? How do we know he wasn't a failed Messiah? The resurrection. The resurrection says, uh-uh, that's my Messiah. 
I think that's good news because otherwise that looks like a failure. Paul sees that. God declares, this is my Messiah because he raised him from the dead. And then Paul goes, oh, this is how it was supposed to happen all along. A couple of things. What are you expecting from your Messiah? There was some different expectations about him. One is that he would attain this victory. Now again, it wasn't the kind of victory. Jesus' victory wasn't the kind that they were thinking it was better. But they were. there was an expectation of a victory. There was also a, a, an expectation, I think this comes from Jeremiah, of a renewal. This renewed community, this renewed person, this circumcision of the heart thing. Some people thought this could be it. Um, some of the ones, John, like you, thought it would come through suffering. Messiah's going to suffer. What does Paul do? Paul actually took all three of those and sees that Jesus did all of these different, there were these different things. Jesus enveloped and wrapped all of them up. He defeats sin and death. That's our victory. He renews us. How does he renew us? sends us his spirit to indwell, revive us, lead us in all of life. How did that happen? It was the suffering love of God that accomplishes all of this. What does the Bible say? He achieved our redemption. Redemption is a buying back situation. It has all kinds of slavery connotations. It's rescue from the slave market. In Israel's history, that immediately goes back to the Exodus story. How were they released? Through Passover. What does the Messiah do? It's the Passover type of deliverance. Victory, renewal, suffering, love. And what's the goal? Verse 14. All of this was so that the blessing of Abraham could flow to the nations in King Jesus. When we think about the times we live in, don't ever lose track of that. Everything that happens here happens under here. <laughs> All right, Jesus is king. And so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. As the blessing of Abraham goes out to the nations, so does the new life of the Spirit. So it's that foretaste of an eventual inheritance. It's poured out on all Jesus believers. I think that's cool. One thing I think that we ought to think about occasionally do we ever think about ourselves as Abraham's children? I don't. I'm starting to rethink that. Yeah, Father Abraham, you do the song. That's a good song, maybe. Donna's offered to lead us in that next week. <laughs> That's a good call, though. No, they tried to do. Oh, uh, they tried to get me to do that at the auction yesterday. Patrick was a winner. He hung out with me, but we had to do our little marching. Um, blessing of Abraham. But again, do we ever think of ourselves as Abraham's children? Paul's argument hinges on us being Abraham's children. What does it mean to be Abraham's children? It means we live within that faithfulness. We're the children, the heirs of faithful Abraham. If we were to think that way, I was thinking, well, what's the point of that? We're God's children. I like that better. Um, both are true. But if I think about myself as Abraham's heir, his descendant, guess what happens when I go back and read the Bible? It's like, this is like family history. This stuff all of a sudden starts to hit really close to home, and all of a sudden is like, oh man, I'm wrapped up in this too. And I think that's a really helpful, I think that's so helpful. So I think it should affect our reading, our understanding, our appreciation of the Bible, the people in it, and its message. And ultimately, this is an identity issue. Who are you? Child of God. Another way to think about that, child of Abraham, connected to the Messiah, living within his faithfulness, as Galatians 2.20 says. And again, all that to receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's exactly where we started. That's exactly where we end. Lord willing, next week I'm going to take a break from this and pass the baton to John Hagen, who incidentally, without coordination necessarily between the two of us, although there was a little bit when we realized what was happening, has a message about you are not your own, you've been bought with a price. Is that right, John? That's cool stuff. Let's pray.
Father, I, I don't know what to say other than just thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for pouring out your love on us. Thank you for coming in person to do what none of us could do, to do what Israel was not capable of doing. You took upon yourself and you freed us from the bondage that leads us to suffering and to death. And you did that through suffering and through death. Take that. What an amazing gift this indwelling of your spirit is, the very, your very self in us, energizing, motivating, accomplishing things that we could never accomplish on our own, and yet you don't wipe us out in the process. There's somehow a, I'm not lost in there. I'm more me than ever when you're filled, when I'm filled with you and you're coming out. Lord, I don't know what to do with all these things, but I just pray that you will continue to just <laughs> pour into us, Father, your truth, your wisdom, your spirit. I, we are living in dark times, and yet we live for a really high and light king. We do live in the light, Father, and I pray that that light will be very evident, um, impossible to deny, because you are the one in us. Uh, you're in this community. You're in us individually. What an amazing truth. I, I just pray that that will have a powerful effect toward advancing your kingdom in our world and uh, we thank you for this I pray that as we go from here we'll continue to dig deeper into your things I pray that you'll bless John Hagen this week as he continues to refine and prepare for next week with this message um, we want everything that you have for us Father give us uh, hearts and minds to receive it in Jesus name Amen All right, we are dismissed may the Lord bless you all this week